Hello everyone. My name is Angshuman Chaudhary and you're watching another episode of IPCS Parallax. It has been more than a year since the military in Myanmar attempted to grab power in a coup by dissolving the democratically elected parliament, declaring a state of emergency and arresting civilian political leaders, including President Win Mint and state councillor and chief of the National League for Democracy, Aung San Suu Kyi. However, the coup initiated by order of the commander in chief, Min Aung Lai, has met with fierce popular resistance. Not long after his takeover, the civilian representatives set up the National Unity Government or NUG as a legitimate government of Myanmar reflecting the mandate of the November 2020 general election. Simultaneously, a countrywide armed revolution emerged, which has decisively challenged the military's overall strategic dominance and even territorial control. Today, we are honored to have with us Her Excellency Dozin Mar Ong, Minister of Foreign Affairs in the NUG, to share her views on the situation both inside Myanmar and the role played by the international community, including immediate neighbors. Welcome, Minister, and thank you so much for taking time out from a busy, busy schedule and speaking with us. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Minister. I'll jump straight to the questions. As I said, it has been more than a year since Minong Line's military attempted a power grab. Where do you think his coup regime stands today in terms of political legitimacy and popularity? Okay. Well, that uh, after it's, it's been uh, over a year that the military has attempted the coup, and so far the people have refused to let them be the government of so Myanmar, let them let them be able to control the Myanmar. That uh, the people have been very determined that they will not stay under military regime, they will not stay under military government. The people are using different approaches to boycott them. People are not paying taxes. People are not paying utility bills. You know that this is the. I think all country is probably the only one who, which will probably make the world record because military is using guns to collect electricity bill from the people. The people are, you know, resisting in different ways. They are opposing the military hunter in different ways on an everyday basis. You know, the numbers of people change. You have a, you have smaller groups, but people, especially the young, young, young generation, they're demonstrating on the streets. They are still organizing strikes to say that we say no to the military hunter. It is not just happening in the capital. Yango is happening in in the upper Myanmar, it's happening in the small villages when there is so much uh, oppression um, that they crack down on the uh, on the cities. They are doing it in the urban, in the rural areas. On the other hand, people no longer can take uh, that uh, the oppression of the military. So people have also have took up uh, have had taken up arms to to to, to, to protect themselves, to defend themselves. We call it the defenseless revolution, and that's something people have taken up to. That our NUG, our minister. Ministry of Defense also have uh, people defense forces that we establish. We also have a local people defense forces that people are establishing to, def to for self defense to protect themselves. So you are seeing such a, uh, many local people defense forces, uh, you know, that uh, that are being emerging all across uh, the country because it comes from the very simple uh, concept that we need to protect ourselves because we have no way to, to protect ourselves for the military. People are taking up whatever it is possible to protect themselves. So one point, military cannot control Myanmar in its entirety. If you uh, you would remember that there has been a burning of towns in different parts of Myanmar and villages like Tandalan in Township in Chin State. They have been burning it for more than 20 times. But do they have control over this town? No, they don't. And now they are even running aerial strikes against civilian targets. And it's like a full-fledged war against its own people. They are burning villages. And just today, just today we have received that, that energy uh, that, that we have uh, NUG has established a mobile clinic, a mobile hospital, that where we provide assistance, the healthcare to the people. They just destroy it today. That uh, we are doing, trying as a government to provide service to the people. We are trying to engage with the people. We are also uh, that uh, participating in this defense, defensive revolution with the people. We also have to appreciate the movement of the people, including the civil servants from the public, both private and public sector, like doctors. We have the teachers. We have a uh, 
railway wheel uh, that uh, this from the railway technicians and the from the various ministry they are still going strong in this uh, civil disobedience movement and we have to appreciate that that shows that military doesn't have control of the country they never they they won't because in such a such situation that i think it is very clear that uh, you know without the public support they will not be able to go around because no right now it's been over, over a year but the the, the coup has been successful they still don't have the support of the people right minister what is the nug's core political vision and strategy today and are they any different from the previous nld government the main difference is that the previous civilian government was not in the current contest. What I'm saying is about the 2008 constitution. We were under 2008 constitution on that uh, because that was the roadmap of the, that, uh, you know, that if you look at the seven points uh, roadmap, we had to go under that road, roadmap of the military because that was that we were under the, we, have, we had to contest the election under the 2008 constitution framework. In a way, the space is quite different and the way we can uh, so also have, uh, we can that is different but after the, the coup itself the coup is beyond the, the, the beyond the, what is provided in the 2000 constitution uh, it is uh, let's be very clear it, 2000 constitution is not something we like and not something that is good for Myanmar it is not a it's not a constitution that can give us a chance to be about uh, to a federal democracy to the it is uh, very much uh, that um, against uh, that what people want and what what the country needs so after the coup the committee representing Finanzo Dos, CRPH, was established with the majority number of the parliamentarians of the 2020 election, 2020 election. We have abolished 2008 constitution. Then we started uh, with the, we replaced it with the Federal Democracy Charter, which is established with the participation and engagement of various stakeholders. Our corporate conviction, we don't want military coups to happen again in Myanmar and that to stop that from happening we need a constitution and we need a constitution that is based on federalism and democracy we that uh, that a constitution that were guarantees the democratic civilian control of the military or the security sector that uh, that armed forces especially military should be under the democratically elected civilian control and that is these are the, our basic principles these are the principles upon which uh, as uh, political forces ethnic uh, and revolutionary forces and the strike committees and strike leaders the popular leaders they, that's what we have uh, developed a federal, a federal democracy each other. We are implementing according to the, the, the strategies and principle of federal democracy each other. And that even if you look at our NUG government, it is not just the, the members of the parliament. We also have uh, through the recommendations that nominees from the ethnic and revolution organization, from the various uh, levels of walks of life, we have included them in the establishment of the NUG government. So in terms of representation, we, there are people, we have people coming from the very diverse background, from very different different contexts. So it is uh, in a way we are the first of its kind in terms of a government coming from looking at the background, looking at the various uh, different contexts world because that helps us, that is a model for our political visioning. But that it is, we are now going through the revolutionary period. Even during the revolutionary period, we are bringing, we are bringing people from different backgrounds, from different uh, institutions to work together, to form a government and to work together as a government. We are at the same time revolutionary government because we are in a way leading, we are also leading this revolution as well. When we talk about our corporate visioning, it is a collective voice. And it is that the, the collective voice which is represented in the Federal Democracy Charter. And these are the principles which you get a political roadmap and guidance for the, our way forward. After the revolution, there will be a time for constitutional drafting. During the constitutional drafting process, we will also follow these principles. We'll have a constitution that reflects the principles of the Federal Democracy Charter. And the that's how we intend to go to do to, to the next part, next phase, which is a transition government. We are now currently in the face of revolutionary government and the revolution. Minister, some outside observers have argued uh, that you know the pro democracy movement in Myanmar today does not have a prominent face, such as the Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, do you believe the movement needs a popular leader like her or a prominent face like her to be successful, or do you see an alternate alternate pathway here? 
Having pathways or not, but we are the ones who are on the ground. We are the ones who are facing that challenge uh, that uh, that uh, is a is a is a public leader. She is also the leader of our party as well, and she is also a parliamentarian who has been elected in the parliament. She also has the has the mandate of the state councillor, and she we she also has to still have a place in our our in our government too. Even if our political leadership ha, have, uh, has been arrested, our generation, the next generation, we are always thinking about we we did, we have we have a very clear idea of how do we how do we want to build our country? Yes, Longsenji, we don't have a face of the revolution, Longsenji, and it will be very hard to, you know, have a new, a new leader, a new face. And that's something we cannot expect in a short time. It takes a lot of time and that, uh, you know, she is uh, one of our era, so we won't have a, the kind of figure in our revolution. But how do we struggle? How do we move forward? I mean, we don't have a political figure. Are we going to just, uh, you know, just sit and do nothing? No, we do what we can within, with the, with the limits that we have with the mandate that we have with that uh, responsibility we have to achieve the, our the goals the political goals that we have said we are going now through collective leadership collective leadership of people coming from different backgrounds from different areas to from other things we are bringing in this diverse background to as a collective leadership to move forward so what does guide us what guide us is that our federal democracy charter this is our political visioning that give us guidance and that uh, through there, because the Federal Deposit Charter was drafted through there, rather than as individual, that what is uh, who is running uh, energy, uh, you can say what is running energy is that we are bringing in all the you know strengths and all the powers and the mandates from coming from different backgrounds, different organizations coming together and form the government and run the government. Yes, we don't have a political figure like Dr. Suji, but despite the absence uh, that we are working strongly with the people and with the support of the people that we are forging ahead in this revolution. Right. Mr. Coming to the neighborhood uh, now, how does the NUG see India's position on the coup so far? Are you satisfied or do you think India should have done more? To be very frank here, I think India will needs to and yes, there are still a lot of things they can do and they are not doing it. That, uh, you know, to be, uh, to go deeper into this, India, that uh, India should be supporting Myanmar democracy movement as well as in our circle. Actually, India seems to be avoiding uh, playing this game of avoidance uh, that uh, they were engaged with just to make look, not, not to make them look bad in the international community. They should be you know, focusing more. They should be investing more to help with the democracy because India has the capacity and ability. There are also ways for India to support. To be very frank here, India seems to be reluctant, seems to, uh, especially Especially for our democracy, democracy crisis, for the the crisis that people are going through, they are not focused, they are not concentrated, and they are not engaged in it. Especially that in here and China. That, that, that we are, because of India and China, because we are a country, a small country, which is right between the two public powers like India and uh, China. So it is, we are we are also become somehow you know, a leverage between the two countries because they want to leverage us to, for their own interests. And that is also another challenge for us. Right. Uh, Minister, since you, I have this great opportunity to speak to you, uh, I wanted to ask you directly, uh, could you give some suggestions to the Indian government um, at the moment what about what it can do on the situation in Myanmar in the immediate short term? Okay. Thank you for this question. For the short term, for the for the, I think it is important to focus on the immediate needs, and this is something I have often repeated myself. Your humanitarian assistance is greatly needed, especially in the border areas, uh, right? Uh, you know, across India, there are a lot of fightings going on. There is a lot of oppression going on, like Chin State, like the Gai region. The, the people from people in these areas, they are rural communities, like the especially area like 
Gai region, they have never had 5DM conflict before. They never had been IDPs. And you know, they, they are, now they are IDPs. Now they are, these villagers are running away for, running for their life. And they run to the nearest border, which is Indian border. And the same goes for the Cheste, like Tantaland. The entire town of Tantaland has been burned several times. All the people have run away to take shelter in the Indian border. Uh, and we also have uh, that uh, political leaders uh, who are also there, or they also have to run away to the Indian border for safety. And for these people, even if India doesn't want to get involved politically, I think India should uh, you know, look at it from the humanitarian perspective on humanitarian ground, they should provide assistance to these people. That, it, that well, I would like to say, like uh, for the, on the looking, I think it is important that India to be more focused as a neighboring country, and that to be able to provide some that system based on humanitarian, whether they want to make a political stand or not, is that this entirely up to them, but humanitarian needs need to be taken into consideration consideration. On the other hand, the military is also like, a, yeah, they are deploying more and more troops and they are really running a full flight military operation in Chen Stadium as a guy region. I think it is also important that India should seriously consider this and provide some assistance to the people in need. Right. Um, so just, I, I'd like to probe a little deeper on this India question, uh, which is that, you know, New Delhi, I think, remains concerned uh, about about the Chinese uh, influence in Myanmar, uh, and also says that it has economic and security interests regarding the border, um, because of which it has been hesitant to take a harder position on the junta. Uh, what do you say about these concerns? And the the concerns uh, that uh, I, we can see the concerns and we can understand them, like uh, you know the. That the investment, there are invest, there are a lot of investment in Myanmar, both from China and India. But what is what makes it hard is that for the voice of the people, like I think it is also important to uh, have this approach where you listen to the the voice of the people, and that will help uh, either India or China to be able to protect their interests better. Because in reality, like uh, you know, what, the investments that are inside Myanmar, the, those who are closest to the investment, the assets are the the people of Myanmar, and the if uh, that the Indian or the China were to go against the will of the people, and they said you just focus on the countering your uh, the competitor, then if they don't if they don't think about uh, they engage with the war those perpetrators of the war crimes and those who are committing as an oppression and violence against the people, India will not be able to protect their interests. Uh, it's the same goes for China. I think if China or India is serious and genuine about protecting their own interests, they want to protect their interests inside Myanmar. It is important to engage more with the people. It is important to engage with energy because we have the public support. And that is important for the long run because only then, uh, only through this kind of engagement that we can, uh, we, we can, uh, we can uh, have the sustainable, the sustainability as well as that we're able to protect their interests. I think it is important so that in terms of policy making, the Indians need to be very careful about the options there. To be pragmatic here, as Myanmar, we cannot, we cannot choose sides. We as a neighbor, as a, based on our neighbors, it is important to keep the balance, keep the harmony, and this is daytime, making sure the balance is maintained. And then if, uh, you know, the concern uh, if they think that uh, you know there are, there are a lot of uh, like uh, you know that uh, making just judgments, one-sided judgment, and approaching that from perspective, that's not the right way to approach these issues. Right. Thank you, Minister. Coming slightly towards uh, the extended neighborhood now, um, how do you see this the ASEAN's five-point consensus process panning out, um, particularly under Cambodian chairmanship? We have seen. Um, that there has been a lot of dithering and back and forth on this over the last few months, um, uh, particularly regarding the special envoys. You know, we have seen that the junta has once again refused, um, you know, a meeting between the special envoy and the NUG. Uh, does the NUG have faith in this process um, anymore, particularly under Cambodian cha chairmanship this year? Okay. Tomorrow. Okay. Us in 
we are a member state of the ASEAN. We are part of the ASEAN family. So our policy is to engage with ASEAN, and that's our uh, that that's what we that's what we intend to. It doesn't matter who is chairing the ASEAN. We we stand ready to engage with them. We are also we already have communicated to Cambodia that we are willing to engage with them, and that uh, that that as a chair of the ASEAN as well in uh, trying to resolve the problem, the crisis. I think engagement is necessary it is also important those who are in uh, who, who who are in uh, in the in a position to uh, have resolved they need to be informed about our country they need to be informed about the complexity of the situation only then they can make the right decision only when they can make the right intervention so it doesn't matter if it is cambodia now before i think uh, cambodia refused to listen to our request and they try to engage directly but time only that as you can see time tells indeed because the the dictators they never change their sport. So Cambodia, uh, that uh, the Cambodia, the prime minister is only like two months now. And within two months, they understand really how that um, how military hunter is that that the, the issue of the Myanmar crisis, the Myanmar crisis, it may be that uh, it's uh, not something easy to do. They need to do a lot of homework and a lot of legwork. If they didn't do their homework, then it will be a wrong approach, and that will also lead up to the ancestors, uh, ancestors for uh, that uh, you know that uh, efforts as well. Cambodia still have ten men. 10 months in their chairmanship. I hope that in the next 10 months and they, that the next approaches they make towards Myanmar, they will be better informed and they will also choose a better approaches to deal with as well. As to the ASEAN Fibro consensus, it is not enough. It's not sufficient. Why? Because firstly, the five point consensus, the points mentioned in the five point consensus, is we over a year since that they had attempted the coup and it's no longer adapted to the political contest. It's no longer, you know, that suited to the political contest. The contest has changed. The first point I would like to make that, uh, you know, the one who had signed uh, this, uh, agreed to this private contest, uh, that was the leader of the military hunter. And now he's adding a fit. It's not that he had he didn't go there and uh, agree to that. He was the one who said that, that meeting and then uh, agreed to it. Now he's in there because it's one of the points that, that uh, as the cyber consensus has made was uh, engagement with this all stakeholders, but the special envoy is not allowed to special envoy. They, he's been, they has been opposing against the engagement of special envoy with all stakeholder, And that is something basically wrong that if they cannot implement the five point process, that means the ASEAN will need a new approach, a better approach indeed. That as for the UN special envoy, yes, we have met with the special envoy, that there is UN special envoy, we are the other special envoy. EU also will have a special envoy for Myanmar. So all these special envoys will need to will need to coordinate to be able to find solution together, or will they be just you know using the same old methods and same old approaches? We still that still is that still remains to be seen. Thank you, Minister. Uh, coming to my last two questions. Um, how do you see the ongoing uh, Rohingya genocide case um, that the Gambia has brought against Myanmar at the International Court of Justice? Uh, do you believe the court has legitimized the junta by allowing it to represent Myanmar? Okay. The, uh, for the, as for the ongoing case, uh, that it is quite complicated and complex. But the fact that the military leaderships are going to the Hague and to do stand to do stand to state their, to, stand, to represent the state of Myanmar, IGG accepted them, and that uh, in the opening day, they, I, they, we all have heard what the the, court, the judges have said. They said that very clearly, it is not to lend legitimacy or not to accept the coup. That's one point. But sec, that's one point. Second point is that for us. We want justice. We are look for us. The key is to be able to implement justice. But to be able to find justice, then you know that uh, having the perpetrators, that those who really those who have perpetrated the crimes and go to there and to uh, represent the people of Myanmar and to be able to defend the state of Myanmar is something inappropriate. I would say not. For, it's not appropriate from the legal perspective. I think from the humanitarian, uh, the, the, if you look at it from the Russian of the humanitarian perspective. 
that also is it is something that should not that is not happen that uh, that they get to represent the state of Myanmar in ICG is not an issue for us but for ICG for the international justice when they are trying to address it it is dispute like that then this is questionable this is a questionable decision and that we have made the history what we are trying to find is justice not just for the Rohingya communities but also the people of Myanmar better because there has been a is this a there has been a decade of injustice and we are trying to get justice for all the people who have suffered under the military that is our position that is our stand so that we are we'll continue we're trying to continue for the case with ICJ we are also trying to be able to have that uh, bring up a case with the ICC as well so this is something that we are looking at we are also we stand right uh, and we are engaging with the court we also will also be engaging with the international organization as to that purpose thank you minister um this is something that uh, has has is currently the center of attention around the world and i know energy has already published a statement on it but i wanted to hear from you directly uh, this is regarding the ukraine uh, russia crisis uh, NUG has condemned uh, the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, but we have seen that Southeast governments in Southeast Asia have been a little hesitant of, um, you know, naming Russia in their statements or condemning Russia or calling it even an invasion. Um, in general, how do you see this uh, crisis uh, in the context of both Myanmar and Southeast Asia, particularly given that Russia is one of the top arms supplier to the Myanmar junta? Okay. Uh, well, Russia is not just selling weapons. Actually, Russia is uh, the the Russia already is training a lot of military officials. They give a scholarships and they give a training to the military officials. They have very strong ties with the Myanmar military. It's a country they have been. Uh, they have the strong ties for many years. And uh, if we look at the current uh, crisis that 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 Russia has been invading, invading the the territory of uh, Ukraine, and they are reaching the you know the capital city that ethically as well as on the morally in this today's age and war that is inacceptable if you look at the international laws that is uh, that that, that uh, you know that uh, the un this that let's see the current uh, like uh, you know that is uh, I said that, that that it is also important that the uh, that is as a member as a leading member of the UN instead of being a model for the other countries that they Russia being a superpower you know invading invading a, a smaller country by using military might if we just you know if we let things go on then we are morally responsible for that too just uh, that uh, that also. That uh, they, they, the Russia, one of the Russian uh, Russian leaders also said that well, military should uh, military should uh, conduct you know also the civilian government. They send it to the U Ukraine civilian government, and as a country which is going through the coup, we cannot accept it. It's, it is a military coup means suffering, casualties for the people, and we don't want that to happen in other countries. If we keep silent, then I think we sh we cannot. We simply cannot uh, be in good conscience. I think it is important by going international law as a member of the UN as well as according to international laws in terms of ethics and moral I think this is wrong that uh, this is uh, invasion of uh, in the sovereign state that instead of uh, respecting the other's country that be uh, that I think this kind of bullying this kind of uh, invasion that this kind of attack from a big, bigger country is something as a small country we cannot accept and that's why we have condemned the Russians actions right uh, Minister, this is my absolute last question, I promise. You have been very, very patient, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, it's a bit of a broad question, probably a little difficult to answer in specific terms, but um, you are, I think, the perfect person. I really want to hear it from you. Um, how do you see the next one year panning out for Myanmar's democracy movement? Uh, and simply put, do you think the coup regime will fall anytime soon? Okay. Tomorrow, the Natal Yes, 2022 for us. For as uh, for the pro, for the democracy movement, consider this will be our year, our year of success. It doesn't matter how many issues and crises are growing, uh, you know, arising around the world. 
we have faith that 2022 will be year because the people's commitment, the momentum of people is escalating. It's not going down. The people are still going strong. They are even going stronger against the, against the, against the military hunter. It doesn't matter the, how, how violent the military oppression has been and the crackdown has been. The people have not given up. People are just raving up to be able to you know, push hard out of the revolution. They are committed to this ultimate but the ultimate fight. So it is a commitment that is coming from the every individual uh, from the, for the country. So I support that, that not just in the, it is not something a strong community we made in as a, as a government, as a political leadership. And it is the, it is a genuine commitment of the majority of the people. That means that we are, there are no reason for, 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 no, for us not to be uh, successful in this. Uh, we are also, as a government, we are also looking back on the last year, where, where do we, where we need to improve and where do we you not know, do so well? And we are looking at it with the support of the people. We have the support of the people, not only inside the country, but also from the Vima diaspora across the world, that with their support, that we are we are determined to engage to make a to make a paradigm shift next this year. Thank you once again, uh, Minister. You have been, as I said, incredibly patient uh, and very insightful and comprehensive. I think we have covered a lot of ground in this. Um, interview and I can only wish you and the NUG um, the best and as you said this is going to be the NUG's year and I personally I can say I, I hope that happens um, thank you for speaking to IPCS um, and hope you have a great day ahead okay. thank you